Yeah, thank you. And uh, we are going to focus on uh, the teacher's learning environment uh, today. And uh, I will first uh, introduce what uh, Focus Area 3 is about. Uh, it is about the teacher's learning environment, which is one of our five uh, focus areas in IRS. So I give a little uh, broad overview and then uh, Carly will uh, present a case study uh, when I'm uh, done uh, in uh, 20 minutes or so. So uh, first, a little bit of the history, uh, since many uh, IOS colleagues uh, are part of this, uh, and uh, also uh, Matthias Lundmark uh, used to uh, chair this focus area, but uh, we swapped uh, between focus area two and three. So, but uh, other than that, uh, Kirsty, Kali, and Maria are uh, active in this together with uh, many uh, others in IOS and many colleagues and students uh, else so uh, um, this is a bit of the history and um, I'm just gonna uh, sum up the main goals of this focus area so we want to create a collaborative culture for teaching it's a kind of a, a cultural change that we want to drive with iOS and achieve with iOS and that we want to shift attention from uh, these personal ownership and personal uh, qualities from uh, individual lecturers towards uh, like a collegial effort and collegial ownership uh, of the teaching practice uh, and also a teaching practice that is uh, evidence-based and um, while I'm talking here I would also like to encourage you to think a little bit about how uh, you want IOS to stimulate a collaborative uh, culture for teaching. Uh, so feel free either to take notes about this or write it in the chat box while I talk here. And then we we can uh, sum up afterwards uh, after Carly has uh, also given her presentation. So uh, keep this in mind, please. Uh, also, how can we change the culture in, in IOS? Uh, that means each department towards the teaching uh, as a collegial effort and collegial uh, ownership. So that's something we want to achieve. And uh, I know we have achieved it uh, to some extent, but uh, how can we uh, continue this uh, cultural change in IOS? Also, it's uh, nice to review this uh, slide here that uh, Matthias initially shared. Uh, so we want to achieve uh, this uh, situation here where uh, we all build on each other's strengths and experiences and we build and offer a coherent education to our students uh, rather than running around here as individuals um, and um, we have uh, various ongoing activities to reach these goals and uh, one of them is uh, we uh, develop a site for the educational resources, uh, so-called uh, virtual competence center. It's a part of the, specifically a part of the IOS homepage. It's uh, being developed, but there's uh, some materials there. Uh, and there's uh, certainly also uh, potential to develop this more uh, so that uh, this can actually function as a, a real resource for, uh, for educational material and sharing of experiences and so on. Um, also, we want to initiate and uh, support subtle activities, subtle projects uh, and with students as partners. And um, we also strive to maintain the annual geo-learning forum as a national meeting place for earth science teaching and learning. So uh, this uh, years or the last geo learning forum was number six and uh, that we had in oslo and uh, we think in in many ways that this is a great success it's a great meeting place for students and for colleagues uh, so we want to maintain that and uh, also we have the uh, the competence group the research group uh, in higher education research uh, and there are many research papers coming out now and this also has to do with the uh, PhD students that have uh, been in the in the loop for uh, approximately three years uh, so there are also PhD thesis uh, soon to come out from that uh, so uh, going back to this uh, educational resources uh, we uh, we also have the uh, 
uh, I Earth Digital Learning Forum. We had uh, 13 in last year, and uh, we share those uh, at the webpage uh, under the educational resources, just so that is, is clear for everyone. Uh, that this is a place where you can go and, and look for uh, what has happened uh, earlier in I Earth and other I Earth related activities, uh, seed projects, subtle projects, and so on. Uh, so, uh, supporting and initiating subtle activities with uh, together with our students, this is uh, something that we achieve with the uh, seed projects as uh, as an example. And actually, we have uh, had almost hundred so called seed projects since the start of I Earth. That's pretty impressive, I think. So. Uh, Many of them are still ongoing, or some of them are still ongoing. So I think there's uh, still a lot of results uh, in the pipeline that we uh, look forward to see and, and learn from from these uh, seed projects. Uh, and uh, last year, there were 10 new projects funded. And I just wanted to bring up this slide here. Uh, with the, It's from the annual report, just showing uh, which projects uh, received funding in 2023 and uh, if you look at this uh, we don't have to like I'm, I'm not going to read up the list here for you uh, but you will see actually that many of these projects are now student uh, driven uh, seed projects which is uh, really great and it supports also the student organizations so uh, so it seems like uh, there's been some change from uh, mainly staff driven uh, seed projects towards uh, student driven uh, seed projects uh, at least based on last year. So we also removed the application deadline and maybe it has to do with that. Maybe it's a coincidence, uh, I don't know, but uh, we certainly see much more uh, student-driven uh, projects last year. That's also really great. And uh, the seed projects, they uh, they aim to, to stimulate a number of uh, things that we use to achieve the goals of uh, IEARTH with, co-creation with the students and uh, also involvement uh, of colleagues. Uh, and uh, we also think of uh, collaboration and uh, students and staff from several institutions, both within IEARTH and uh, outside IEARTH uh, working together. And then also we, uh, uh, we encourage that uh, these projects, they disseminate the results, uh, for instance, during the uh, geo learning forum or in some other uh, way social media or conferences and even uh, in educational uh, research journals could also be uh, the winter meeting which uh, was just held in uh, Utebo in Sweden uh, a couple of months ago two months ago uh, and uh, there were many uh, IOS presentations here and a session with seven IOS contributions uh, so that's Really fantastic to see the uh, the outcome of of I Earth uh, at uh, events like like this, and it also shows that uh, I Earth is uh, really unique. Uh, this was a Nordic conference, but it is really uh, unique in the Nordic countries that we actually have these uh, centers of excellence in higher education uh, with an active activity level that is so high, so that we can kind of lead uh, sections at conferences like this. So that's fantastic. Going back to the uh, Geo Learning Forum, uh, that is um, already, I would say, the national meeting place uh, in Earth Science Teaching and Learning. And uh, we had uh, the number five in Bergen in 2022 with 120 participants. And then last year, uh, we had uh, number six in Oslo with 110. And again, half of the participants in these Geo Learning Forum are students, and uh, then we are also really excited for uh, 2024. So later this year, we are going to have the uh, seventh IOT Geo Learning Forum here in Tromsø at uh, November 7 to 8. So if you don't already have this in your calendars, please take a note of the dates here and uh, welcome to, to Tromsø in November. Um, the research, higher education research group, uh, was established uh, as uh, with with the start of IEARTH by Anders Arnberg, uh, and uh, since 
January, Maria Valanda has uh, taken over uh, the leadership of the Educational Research Group uh, as new uh, Associate Professor 2 here in Tromsø. And uh, the group is for uh, IEARTH PhD students, for IEARTH postdocs, and uh, any senior staff with research interests in, uh, in IEARTH. And uh, I think it's uh, really interesting to see the publications to come out now from, from, uh, from this research group. And I just wanted to briefly show here uh, some of the work that came out uh, last year. And I think, uh, or at least based on the uh, annual report, there were six, six uh, publications coming out. And uh, these uh, also uh, span really uh, broadly as, uh, as we do in, in iEarth. So, uh, Everything here from uh, virtual field experiences and uh, activity bingos to uh, student guides and laboratory experiments, and uh, uh, also a study here again from uh, from UIB with the uh, the introduction of active learning and computational practice at a bachelor level course. So this spans uh, really wide, and uh, also uh, have a look at uh, at the annual report, which is uh, at the IEARTH homepage, if you want to see some of the, the results that uh, that, that uh, were produced in, in 2023, not only in terms of papers, but also in terms of conference presentations and uh, various seminars, workshops, and so on and so forth. So uh, have a look at the, at the homepage and see the annual report. Also, the uh, research group it, uh, runs a journal club for uh, teaching and learning. It has uh, approximately four meetings per semester with the uh, discussion of uh, an article and, and pre presentation of articles. And uh, this is, uh, in that in that sense, a quite traditional activity in, in research groups that you have these journal clubs. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, everyone is welcome also to, uh, to join that. And uh, next meeting is actually tomorrow. Yeah, 12.15, so uh, you have the chance soon. And uh, also I want to dwell a little bit with uh, another aim of IEARTH, namely the uh, UN Sustainable Development Goals uh, that we uh, actually want to implement in the uh, in, in the educations that we, we offer. And I always like to show this uh, illustration here showing uh, how the UN SDGs uh, are related uh, to various aspects of the uh, geosciences here so we can maybe look at more traditional uh, high, uh, traditional uh, geoscience here as hydrocarbon uh, exploitation and uh, uh, storage of energy and, and geothermal energy and so on but uh, basically these sustainable development goals, we can help uh, achieve these uh, in a lot of different ways with uh, with the uh, geoscience. Uh, one is, for instance, to hydropower and geomorphology to understand and uh, prevent natural hazards, paleoclimatology to understand uh, our past climate and uh, model our future uh, climate and try to uh, understand that and uh, maybe even uh, build societies that uh, that are more adapted to the climate that we expect. So lots of different ways that geoscientists can uh, help uh, to achieve these uh, UN SDGs. And uh, last year, we focused quite a lot of, on this in IEARTH, uh, and it was done uh, by having uh, workshops uh, in Tromsø, Bergen, Oslo, and Longyearbyen, and at the Geolearning Forum, uh, where Susan Kaspari from uh, Washington State University, uh, and she was also here in Tromsø as a Fulbright Scholar last year, she gave uh, workshops on how you integrate the sustainability into the curriculum. So this is something that uh, all the staff has had a chance to familiarize themselves with and uh, learn more about last year. Now I think we need to see whether there were actually any integration of the SDGs or any increased integration of the SDGs into the uh, uh, geoscience curricula. And uh, I think I'm just going to uh, 
run over this slide and uh, then dwell a bit with the planned activities for next year. And um, we uh, still want to uh, develop more shared courses uh, across the consortium. And there are some or many uh, in the pipeline in various stages. Uh, some are mentioned here, GIS courses relatively uh, well underway, I know, uh, which is of interest to the bachelor students, the undergraduate students at all our institutions. Then there are uh, courses uh, that have at least been discussed to develop into some of these shared courses in quaternary geological methods and uh, geochronology, and uh, probably more that I'm uh, not aware of. Uh, and also the educational research uh, resource webpage still is uh, underway, it's not fully developed, and uh, I'm not sure that we actually have a like a a uh, well-developed plan for how it should uh, should look, uh, how long time it uh, should should be there, and who the users are, and how it should be used, and so on. But there is a lot on it. Uh, but I think maybe we also should discuss uh, a little further uh, what we uh, want with it in the in the long run. Uh, for and with the long run, I think of uh, the second second half of IOS. Earth. Um, then uh, we've seen uh, more uh, local meetings seem to have a success. It uh, involves more colleagues and students, and uh, we get kind of uh, stretched further out with uh, with I Earth, with the the local meetings uh, that we have had. Uh, for instance, here in in Tromsø among the uh, staff uh, with cultural change as a headline uh, during the during the last couple of years. Um, so uh, more regular workshops uh, with this cultural change in mind that we want to achieve with with IOT. And there are some challenges uh, to this cultural change uh, that I would like to bring up here, and we can come back to that uh, after Carly's part of this presentation. So we so we come back to this and, and uh, discuss it. Some of the challenges that I see here is that it's, uh, and it, it has to do with uh, IUF being a consortium uh, with uh, thousands of kilometers uh, in between. Uh, how how can we actually take actions at other in institutions? Uh, we, we've been, we're much better at this and we've learned much more about it than, than from start, but uh, I think it's still something that we need to dwell a little bit about and 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 make some decisions on how how we actually implement some of the cultural change, for instance, that we want to do. How do we actually bring that around to different institutions, uh, and also how actually we measure and document the effect of uh, some of the IEA actions, which is uh, super important also for the funding of the second half of, of IOS that we can actually, we have clear measures and documentations of, of what we actually achieve. Um, and then uh, it seems to work for us here in Tromsø to have these uh, regular workshops and seminars with cultural change themes. Uh, so that could be an idea to take up in Bergen, Oslo or Longyearbyen. Uh, also, I Earth uh, has a goal that everyone should have teaching portfolios that are updated and well developed. So we have had workshops on that also, at least here in Tromsø, I think also at some of the other institutions. So Anders Alberg has given workshops on that. Uh, but this is probably something that we need to be better at. And this also relates to documenting and, and measuring the effects of uh, some of the IOS actions. I think it's important that, uh, that the uh, teaching portfolios are actually, that, that we help colleagues uh, uh, in best case uh, maintain them and uh, other cases uh, develop them from, from scratch. Uh, also the C projects, they are really great and they span so wide. So it's fantastic to see. And it's uh, quite impressive to see uh, almost 100 seed projects have been run, but there's still more potential to learn from the outcome of them. Uh, 
So it's, uh, yeah, I think there's, there's something uh, we need to somehow uh, stimulate to, to more activity, for instance, on uh, social media, uh, on the on the outcome of them, and, and uh, also more activity on the posters uh, at uh, the geolearning forum. And it could also be some of the seed project holders uh, actually joining uh, other conferences uh, and presenting their their results. So I think uh, I think I will end here and then uh, Kali will take over and uh, we can take uh, discussion afterwards. So Kali will uh, you will have uh, fifteen minutes. So that gives us uh, ten minutes for discussion afterwards. So over to you, Kali. I will stop sharing here. Let's see. All right. Can everybody see my presentation? Yes. Okay, perfect. All right. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about some of the ongoing research we have in the teacher's learning environment, focus area three, um, and particularly sort of two to three projects. So I'm sure everybody has seen bingo by now um and at least maybe tried to do a bingo at the geo learning forum or heard about it or been asked to do one there are bingos it feels like everywhere these days um but if you're not aware of how this all started um the bingo has come from an article that was published uh in oceanography last year by miriam glesma uh linda letuta francesco i can't pronounce his last name and shirsti doa and the premise of it is that students generally like fieldwork, but they don't always make the most of their fieldwork. And there can be a wide gap between what they learn in the field and then what they later need when they actually conduct research, say, for example, in their master's. There's also some inclusivity challenges in the field where students um, come to fieldwork with a wide gap in their experience of being in the outdoors, their comfort in the outdoors. And so bingo activities can help kind of leveling the playing field. Um, and it also addresses how we can motivate students to be a bit more engaged um, in their field learning. So the idea behind the bingos is that they give prompts and nudge the students to engage in activities that they might not naturally, or maybe not all students naturally tend to engage with. And so this is the example of the bingo card that was um, uh, published in the paper or in the, the yeah and it was the idea is behind the bingo is that they're more appealing than a checklist um, they have specific things where the students sort of um, have to work on for example fly an instrument kite in this bingo and then there are more choice related activities in the colored boxes um, where the students can sort of uh, come up with their own way to engage with those activities but this bingo was implemented on a four day teaching cruise. And we have decided to do some research on what it would look like to have bingos in other contexts. How do the bingos work? Um, would they work in classroom settings? How does that look? Um, what happens if you try to run them over short periods of field work or long periods of field work? And what about different topics in the geosciences and biosciences? Uh, do they, how would they work in, for example, a geohazards course versus a quaternary geology course? So we defined some research questions. We got a group together of researchers, Kirsty Dunnett, myself, Miriam Glesma and Shasta Doa, um, had, trying to answer whether there are specific contexts that the bingos are particularly useful for or obvious for. Uh, we're trying to answer a bit more broadly across different contexts what the students think and how that affects their motivation to engage with fieldwork or even classroom activities. And then also what are the challenges of implementing these bingos and, and um, what factors actually influence their implementation. But what is special about this project is that we're including teachers as um, collaborators um, in a process which we're calling co collective subtle sea subtle and I'll come back to what why that's important a bit later when I address the sea subtle project 
But so we have plenty of other co-authors from University of Oslo, Tromsø, Bergen, Eunice, and also one being from McGill University in Canada. But before I go into our approach, we, um, in doing research, we have to define a theoretical framework. So looking into a bit sort of more of the theory behind the bingos. Um, and we've landed on focusing on sort of making the hidden curriculum um, visible and transferable skills, but more visible, which is really a big aim of the bingos. And then also understanding how and why bingo might motivate students to engage with activities better, where we're basing um, our background on sort of self-determination theory, which is um, more intrinsic motivation, where there's sort of an absence of external influences and the bingos emphasize autonomy, um, building competence, and then sort of the relatedness aspects of learning and motivation. And we're also framing it with an expectancy value theory, which is more related to um, the idea that there is an expectation um, that there is some value to the activities for the students. So we'll look at the motivation um, and how the students answer the surveys within the framework of these two theories. And then also gamified learning is a concept where we augment um, an existing learning structure into a game type format, um, which can affect uh, the experience of the students. And this has shown to be effective in the research. It increases engagement and interaction and supports social relate the related side of learning. Um, but the research is still a, a bit unclear on um, how exactly gamification um, achieves uh, its teach its learning and especially within the cognitive side of things. So this is sort of the theoretical framework behind the bingos. But what we're actually doing is a collective approach to scholarship of teaching and learning research. And so we are examining how and why these bingos might work or not work. Um, and we're doing it in a way where we are involving the teachers in the research process. So we've got this figure here, which shows sort of a research cycle. It's from Christy Dunn's recently submitted paper um, to the International Journal for Students as Partners, but it works quite well when we think of teachers as partners as well. So partnering researchers and teachers together um, where we sort of have a hop on hop off approach to research. And in the case of the bingo project, it's been the researchers who've identified the problem um, and the researchers who've sort of scoped the research questions. But then we work together with the teachers to plan the data collection. So helping them um, construct their bingos. We have a um, ready-made survey for students that teachers can modify. Um, and we have a teacher feedback form, which asks teachers about their experience of running the bingos with students. And then the idea is, is there's a collaboration in the planning of the data collection. And then there's the teachers tend to collect the data, uh, run the bingos, collect the survey data. Um, and then there will be a collaboration between teachers and researchers in analysis of the data and, and reporting. So essentially what we end up with here is a manuscript of co with collaboration between teachers and researchers. So where are we in the project? Um, last year, we received NSD approval for our surveys and teacher reflection uh, questions, and we've established a data plan. We've run some bingos already, and there are plenty being run this semester. And we have already got some student survey data, teacher reflection data. Um, we're collecting bingo cards at the moment. And Kirsty has already started experimenting a little bit with the data analysis methods with some of the survey data that we all have collected in. And then to come, we have uh, teacher workshops at the end of the spring semester. For any teacher who has run a bingo and is part of the project, we'll start looking at how that data is um, processed and looking at some of the preliminary interpretations that can come out of it. And then the researchers will kind of do the bulk of the data analysis of the student survey data and teacher reflection data. And we aim to submit the manuscript towards the end of 2024. But what's come out of this bingo project um, is that we actually have a lot of bingos and they have different functions. And we ended up with event bingos run at things like the Geolearning Forum, and we've ended up with educational bingos running courses. We found that they have quite different purposes. Um, 
we were initially going to include them in the same manuscript, but actually we are peeling out the event bingos into their own manuscripts since they have a, sort of a different framework um, and motivation behind them. And then what I'm going to talk about next is uh, the CSOFL project, um, which is bingo kind of works as a case study for. So we've see subtle, um, it started, um, or it kind of has its roots in a blog post that Kirsty Dunnett wrote towards the end of last year, um, asking what happens if we do subtle together? Because subtle scholarship and teach of teaching and learning research um, and I've got a quote up here, in most subtle work, it's um, work is shared when it's made available to outsiders through dissemination review. The investigation itself is a private or solitary endeavor. So often with scholarship of teaching and learning research, it's either a teacher that is in investigating something in their own teaching, and so it's quite a solitary exercise, or it's researchers that go in and um, Kind of faculty are involved, but mostly as data collectors, not as collaborators. And so Kirsty in her article here asked sort of what happens if we approach subtle as collective scholarship? What if we all work together with the sort of ultimate goal of an entire department doing subtle research together, which is probably quite idealistic, but it would be an interesting exercise. And so we've got this project now. We are we're going to incorporate, incorporate the bingo project after it's been run um, in a case as a case study. And I have another case study which I'll touch on in the next slide. But we're looking at essentially scholarship of teaching and learning as a collective enterprise. Um, so putting together what that research cycle model looks like. So we're trying to answer research questions and what can collective SOTL look like. Um, how might these projects be structured and approached? What kind of roles do researchers need to play? What kind of roles can instructors or teachers play? Um, and then are there specific points where the barriers involving instructors as collaborators are particularly low? How do we get more people involved in these kinds of projects? So many of you will probably remember Matthias's poster from the Geo Learning Forum. Uh, with the title, Turning Teaching Questions into Research Questions. And this is really, you know, motivating people to, uh, teachers to investigate any questions they have in their own teaching. And so the C subtle project that we, or the manuscript that we will write, will use the bingo project and also a C subtle project that Matthias is running in Oslo for looking at student attendance in class. Uh, he's running it with um, teachers in Oslo. And we will use these two studies or these projects as case studies within the CSOTL project to understand what CSOTL can look like. Um, and this is still in its really early phases because obviously these both of these CSOTL projects are still running. But if we kind of put this into a research cycle or table format, you can see that in both cases, in terms of the problem identification and research questions, it's mostly the researchers that are involved. And then we sort of start collaborating between teachers and researchers in the later phases of this research cycle. But one of the things we want to look at in the paper is what happens if you change these roles? Where can, so for example, teachers uh, have the problem identification? Um, maybe researchers can help them frame the research questions and then the data planning, data collecting, um, these roles can switch back and forth. Um, so the goal of the CSOTL project is to really gather an idea of what CSOTL can actually look like, what are the possibilities, and, and how do we, do we go forward with that kind of work. Um, and then finally, uh, the last project that I'd like to talk about that no one's heard about yet, because it's really only been in my mind and up until recently, is what I will be, or well, I would like to be focusing my main postdoc research on, and that is understanding field teaching culture. Um, so if we want to improve field teaching, if we want to develop all these different field teaching tools, we kind of need to understand what we are already doing, why we're doing it, and where we're learning those field teaching skills. My background is as a bedrock field geologist. I've done a lot of field teaching. I've assisted with a lot of field teaching in different countries. Um, and I've seen a lot of different teaching methodologies. 
but most of and most of us at least in in the nordic countries get some kind of teaching training um for teaching in classrooms lectures and things but we don't really or at least in my experience get much training into in how we teach in the field so what i'm interested in looking at is what are the dominant field teaching philosophies in the geosciences how are people approaching their field teaching what are the pedagogical approaches that are are used most commonly and how and where do geoscience teachers learn and develop their, their field teaching skills so my approach is still in its very early phase, looking at the literature review and the theoretical frameworks, what's actually out there. And I am not managing to find a lot for geosciences, actually. Uh, my goal to answer some of these questions will be to use teacher interviews. So I would be very interested in talking to anyone who does any kind of field teaching um, as to what their philosophies are and where they've learned their teaching field skills. And then I'm looking into the idea of joining some field trips to observe pedagogical approaches. So these are just little snippets of what's happening in terms of research in the uh, in focus area three, the teacher's learning environment. And then Kirsty very kindly sent me some statistics for the journal club uh, attendance uh, over the last um, just over a year or so. The journal club went from only in Oslo to hybrid in 2023. So we, as you can see the statistics here, um, majority of the journal club events have, have a number of attendees between five to 10 people. And it's a good mix between uh, those sitting in Oslo and uh, those on Zoom. And then finally, as Anders mentioned, we have a journal club tomorrow. Um, the title of the paper is Understanding the Scope of Undergraduate Research, a Framework for Curricula and Pedagogical Decision-Making. It's by Angela Brew. Um, and we, the, the IOS uh, research group will be hosting it from the field station just outside of Tromsø because we're all up here in Tromsø now uh, for a three-day um, research retreat. Um, that is everything from me. Thank you.